All right. Um, let's return to Galatians chapter 2, verses 11 through 16, so that we can read it together and then I can ignore it. I will touch on it in passing. And before I do read it, I've decided, going back and forth, that I'm going to add one more sermon to this sub-series on justification, but it's going to come at it from a more redemptive historical point of view. Because there is this Roman Catholic apostle named James, and that's a joke, and he's holding out for justification by works. So he and Paul apparently are at odds within the Bible itself. And what interests me about it is they're both interested in the same text, the same individual, Abraham, and his justification by faith. So we're going to work from James chapter 2 over and against Paul and see how actually, of course, they do agree, but how interesting is it that in all the talk about justification by faith, and obviously you have to say things like it's the doctrine by which the church stands or falls, that's what Luther said, and the glorious reform tradition, that it all began, of all places, in Genesis chapter 15, where justification is just sort of dropped in there without any real preparation and without any explanation. So well before the law was given, Abraham was justified by faith. Now it's up to James and Paul to deal with that event and look at it in two different ways, but ways that are ultimately complementary. So that will be the last Sunday of November. And as for our text, which has everything to do with uh, Genesis 15, 6, ultimately. But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face, because he stood condemned. For be so, before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. Just file that, please. Why did he draw back when certain men came from James? He was afraid. He was afraid of what Paul calls the circumcision. He was afraid. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically. So he's afraid and he's a hypocrite along with him, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, that is, when they withdrew from eating with Gentiles and maintained a kosher table, Paul says that is not in step with the truth of the gospel. Why? I said to Cephas before them all, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? We ourselves are Jews by birth. We're not Gentile sinners, yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Jesus Christ, that is, we've had faith in him, in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. I can close the Bible now. <laughs> well, I grew up reciting the Nicene Creed in church. I, we may have actually done it weekly, I don't recall, but it's a regular part of the Roman uh, Mass's liturgy. And so, as a result of weekly repetition, I knew the words. And if you had found me in my late teens on my very worst day and said, hey, 
Can you give me the opening words of the Nicene Creed? I probably could have done it without thinking. Because there was a time when I knew the words, but I didn't own them as my own. And maybe that's how creeds and catechisms work. Our children can learn the words. They can even learn what those words mean. They can even learn what those words mean and where they come from in the Bible. But it is not in the parents' power, and it is not in the church's power, to make them own those words for themselves. That is, to announce them as their own, or, or maybe we could say to confess them as something that they believe from their hearts. So they can recite them, but they can't confess them. They can't tack on, if you will, a, a, a prelude that says, here is what I sincerely believe from the bottom of my heart. Now, if we have saving faith, then I think we should all, everyone here, own the words of the Heidelberg Catechism's uh, teaching on justification for ourselves. That's what the Catechism was written for. So that Jeff, so that Ron, so that Bob, so that Marcia, so that Mario, so that Edith, any and all of us can look in the mirror and ask ourselves the question, how am I righteous before God? I know I belong to a church. I know I belong to a religious institution. But now as I'm standing alone, looking in the mirror, just between the two of us, me and my reflection, how am I righteous before God? I better get that right. And I can say, and I hope all of you can, with that same sincerity that I now say the, uh, or announce or confess the Nicene Creed, only by true faith in Jesus Christ. That is, although my conscience accuses me that I have grievously sinned against all the commandments of God and have never kept any of them, and to this day I'm still prone, I'm still prone to all evil, Yet God, without any merit of mine, of mere grace, grants and imputes to me the perfect satisfaction, righteousness, and holiness of Christ, as if I had never committed nor had any sins. And I still, this is still hard to read. And had myself accomplished all the obedience which Christ has fulfilled for me. If only I, looking in the mirror, only you accept such benefit with a believing heart. Memorize those words. And be prepared to recite them. No, no, no. Be prepared to announce them with the proper humble conviction when you are standing before the judgment seat of Christ. Rehearse them if you have to. As long as they're your own and not just words that you recite because you're in a religious meeting on a Sunday morning. But if you want to know better the how and the why behind your confident confession in the very presence of the Lord Jesus Christ, then I suggest you supplement Heidelberg Catechism with the Westminster Shorter Catechism's 33rd question and answer. Then you'll get the full picture. This is sort of an ongoing 
little bit of humor between the Dutch and the mm. Scottish Presbyterians, you know. The Dutch have this kind of heartfelt religion. How am I righteous? What is your only hope in life and in death? And Westminster says, why are we here? <laughs> to glorify God and enjoy Him forever, right? It's more analytical. I'm not making fun of either one. When they're together, they're so gloriously complementary. And so here is this outpouring. It's, it's as if, you know, I'm still prone to all evil, but I believe in Jesus. He's my righteousness. He's my satisfaction. He's my salvation. And then along comes the Westminster Standards and defines it from a more objective point of view. And that helps. Mm -hmm. So we're going to do that this morning. We're going to look briefly, it has to be brief, at the 33rd question of the Westminster Shorter mm -hmm. Catechism. But before I begin that part, let me review question 31 in the Shorter Catechism first. Because question 31 represents one part of the Reformation's effort to reclaim a biblical doctrine of justification by faith alone from the Catholic Church. And they did so with the great insight of distinguishing justification from God's effectual call. They aren't one and the same thing. They are two separate parts, if you will, in the order of salvation. And so question 31 is, what is effectual calling? Effectual calling is the work of God's Spirit, whereby convincing us of our sin and misery, enlightening our minds and the knowledge of Christ, and renewing our wills, He doth persuade and enable us to embrace Jesus Christ freely offered to us in the gospel. Now, Catholicism, as we saw, puts all of that under the heading justification. So everything that I read in question 31 and its answer belongs under justification and actually includes sanctification too for the Roman Catholic Church. But we see it differently. This effectual calling, as I said last week, carries with it, it's a gift, but it carries with it a gift basket of benefits, including, but not limited to, justification, adoption, and sanctification. And as we open up this gift basket, the one we come upon first, is justification. And so here is question 33. What is justification? Justification is an act of God's free grace, wherein He pardons all our sins and accepts us as righteous in His sight, only for the righteousness of Christ imputed to us and received by faith alone. It's my very favorite definition of justification. And that question and answer provides the five points. How do you like that? Calvinistic church with a five-point sermon to this morning's sermon. And so my first point Justification is an act of God's free grace. Justification is an act of God's free grace. It's an act. Mm. The Westminster Divines were deliberate in their word choice here. And their word choice perhaps is best understood over and against the Tridentine doctrine, that is the doctrine of Trent, which views justification not as an act, but, well, here it is. Justification itself is not remission of sins merely, but also the sanctification and renewal of the inward man. 
Do you, there's justification is sanctification. And the renewal of the inward man through the voluntary reception of the grace and of the gifts whereby man of unjust becomes just and of an enemy a friend that so he may be an heir according to hope of life everlasting. And so we stand back now 500 so years later and say, wait, justification is the sanctification and the renewal of the inward man? Do you know what this means? This means that justification may take an entire lifetime. And in light of Roman Catholic doctrine, I'm not being flip here, it may take an, an entire lifetime and then some in the next life to keep on working toward becoming just. Because according to the Catholic Church, justification is the process of the unjust man or the unrighteous man becoming righteous. No, 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 says the Reformed faith. Justification is an act. It's not a work, it's an act. In fact, it's a one-time action, which, again, may be best understood over and against the Reformed doctrine of sanctification. So, these are back-to-back -back in our catechism. Westminster Shorter Catechism 34. You just heard, what is justification, right? Justification is an act of God's free grace. Very next question, what is sanctification? Sanctification is the work of God's free grace. The work, the ongoing work, not the act, not the once for all decision. And I won't even read the rest of it. Just the idea that act and work are distinguished here from each other within the catechism and then over and against Roman Catholic doctrine. I want to stress that. Trent's justification is the Reformed faith's effectual call, justification and sanctification. They have one word for all three. That's why we saw things in the our confession of faith, you know, it seems a little bit archaic, but not by infusing righteousness into them. That's looking at Roman Catholicism when they say things like that. All right. So with these three properly distinguished, what happens next? And that's our second point this morning. Justification is an act of God's free grace wherein he pardons all our sins. We believe in the forgiveness of sins, says the Apostles' Creed. We acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, says the Nicene Creed. And just like our text in Psalm 130 and in Romans 3, we believe that God forgives sinners. Even Trent acknowledges this, right? It's almost taken for granted. Not remission of sins merely. But in Westminster Shorter Catechism 33, they chose the word pardon. He pardons all our sins. Which I suspect, I'm not an expert on, you know, the, the, all the background of uh, the meetings at the Westminster Assembly and their catechisms and all the rest of it. But I suspect by using the word pardon, wherein he pardons all of our sins, they are trying to reinforce the courtroom imagery, the courtroom setting of justification. Because the word pardon connotes a release from the legal penalty, penalties of an offense or an official warrant of remission of penalty. And so the act of pardoning in the courtroom 
extends to all of our sins. Past, present, and future. All of our sins. If what I said last week is true, and I believe it is, that the act of justification is, in a sense, the announcement of the end-time verdict in God's court brought forward into the moment, into the present, then all of our sins are pardoned in justification. Now, I won't say too much about this aspect of justification by faith, because it is again going back to the Apostles Creed the most familiar aspect of salvation ask anyone what salvation is any Christian maybe a lot of non-Christians and they'll say something about the forgiveness of sins and this is right of course but there are some unintended consequences to sort of exaggerating the forgiveness of sins if the exaggeration has the effect on other aspects of justification. Because pardoned sins, right, take those two words, pardoned sins is not a synonym for legal righteousness. They are closely related, but they are not two ways of saying the same thing. This is where we go back all the way to the first mention of justification. Abram believed Yahweh and he forgave him all his sins. I hope that sounded funny to you because I didn't quote the text right. Abram believed Yahweh and he counted it to him as righteousness. This is our third point this morning, and perhaps the one that deserves more attention in modern Christianity than it gets. Justification is an act of God's free grace, wherein He pardons all our sins and accepts us as righteous in his sight. He accepts us as righteous in his sight. What did the Heidelberg Catechism ask? Not how are your sins forgiven, though it may ask that somewhere else, I don't recall. It says, how are you righteous before God? How are you righteous before God? And what does the word justify mean? As we've already seen, it means to render a favorable verdict, to vindicate. That is, if a man is in a court and he's complied with the law and no charge can be set against him, the court will say, you are righteous. You are the righteous one. You've been vindicated. But it can also mean to treat as just. To treat as just. Now, it would take one of my typical 14-year-long Sunday school classes to study all the righteous words in the Bible, Old and New Testaments, right? Righteousness, righteous, justify, and so on, and how they're used. They appear hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times. In fact, you see them so often you probably don't even think about them anymore. We see someone say, uh, so-and-so is righteous in my sight. We're called to do righteousness. We're shown how the righteous man behaves and thinks this way, and the wicked man behaves and thinks this way. Or this is the way of the righteous man, this is the way of the wicked man. God himself, of course, is righteous. He loves righteousness, and he does righteousness. It's all over the place. But the word itself, within its more legal context, that is, within the context of Israel's law, connotes conformity to a standard. How a person 
or really even an entire nation, lines up with the divine requirements of the Torah. Righteousness is conformity to the Torah, to Israel's law. Right? Is that fine? In fact, in a passage that deserves more attention, in Deuteronomy chapter 6, 24 through 25, Moses says, And Yahweh commanded us to do all these statutes, to fear Yahweh our God for our good always, that he might preserve us alive as we are this day. And it will be righteousness for us if we are careful to do all this commandment before Yahweh our God as he has commanded us. So Israel's obedience to the Torah will be righteousness to us if we conform to the law. And this is an, an entirely alien concept, right? If I was driving 55 miles an hour and the cop says I was driving 85 miles an hour, I was actually in conformity to the law. And when I appear in court, and if some miraculous way I can produce evidence that I was driving 55 miles an hour, I will be vindicated in the courtroom. In a sense, I'll be announced judge to be righteous. That is in the right, in conformity to the speed law at least of Massachusetts, where they still drive 55 miles an hour. Israel's obedience to the Torah will be righteousness to us. But this was the Moses who, I don't know, just four books back, described Abraham's faith in Yahweh as credited to him as righteous. How interesting is that? And when you look at the words, the way the words are arranged, they look very much alike. So before the law, Abram's faith, he believed God, Yahweh credited it to him as righteousness. Under the law, if we obey the law, says Moses, it will be righteousness to us. That is, we will have conformed to it. What's important here, and why I, I want to look a little bit more at this through James, is that it's this distinction between Torah righteousness and by faith in Jesus Christ righteousness that is exactly the distinction that Paul is stressing in Galatians 2.16. And what's, what makes it so interesting is Paul says, Peter, you know this. You know this. Peter and those who followed him, even Barnabas. No, not Barnabas. Even Barnabas. They did not reason. They did not. This is so important, I think, to understand. They did not revert to conscious, conscience-stricken strugglers under uh, the heavy load of their own conscience and they attempted to earn their way into heaven by law-keeping, that became kind of a caricature of the Jews uh, under, you know, in, in um, the New Testament. That they're earning their way into heaven. This has nothing to do with earning anyone's way into heaven. They were simply being Jewish again. And the problem with being Jewish again is that era of redemptive history is over and it does not conform to the truth of the gospel because it goes back to dividing Jews and Gentiles. So Peter's not earning his way into heaven. He's afraid of the other Jews. Better he, better he was trying to earn his way into heaven than just be kind of a coward and a hypocrite. And on behalf of cowards and hypocrites everywhere, I recognize it when I see it. What Peter and Barnabas and the rest were doing was they were returning to a standard of righteousness that A, had been weakened by the flesh and therefore could only bring condemnation, and B, 
excluded all the Gentiles who shared their faith in Jesus Christ. And they did that despite knowing, despite knowing that justification was by faith in Jesus. They did that despite knowing what the promise to Abram was, that Gentiles would be included in his family one day. So, to the Jews who came from James, the Torah seemed to provide those Jews with a way to live, mm. but it was not a way to life. I'm putting that on Twitter. I like that one. <laughs> yeah, I, I need to say that one again because it's. I never get those catchy little ones, you know. They were... It provided those Jews with a way to live, but it was not a way to life. Which, says Paul, is and always has been by faith alone. And since the arrival, the appearing of Jesus, we can say not faith in the Messiah to come, but faith in Jesus Christ, the incarnate second person of the Trinity. And so Paul can say, from the Old Testament, now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law. For as Habakkuk wrote, the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith. They are two, in a sense, opponents in redemptive history. As Moses wrote, the one who does them shall live by them. So we have two ways, if you will, of being righteous. Habakkuk's way, the righteous shall live by faith, or Moses' way, the one who does them, the one who does shall live. We need righteousness, but the way to gain Righteous, to be accepted as righteous in his sight, is justification by faith alone, where not only does he pardon all our sins, but he accepts us as righteous in his sight. Remember the end of the sheep and goats parable? Jesus says that the righteous shall go into eternal life, not the forgiven. And brethren, we must have righteousness. And if we have none of our own, spoiler alert, we don't, then we need someone else's. And that's my fourth point this morning. Justification is an act of God's free grace wherein he pardons all our sins and accepts us as righteous in his sight only for the righteousness of Christ imputed to us. Only for the righteousness of Christ imputed to us. This is what Luther called the alien righteousness. A righteousness from outside of ourselves and from another. The only one whose righteousness can stand up in the divine court is Jesus Christ's. We need not our righteousness ultimately, but his. And so against our critics, our doctrine is not based on a legal fiction, as if God, out of his great love, suspended his own attribute of righteousness in order to bypass his own attribute of justice, as if he had opened the new creation's border and looked the other way while we all streamed over it. No. And because of God, wrote Paul, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Jesus Christ became to us righteousness. 
What exactly is Christ's righteousness? Oh, there's 90 sermons right there. Let me do it in a very brief form. It is the whole Christ's righteousness. His whole person, which very much includes his obedience to the same law that condemned Israel to curse and exile. So in that respect, God didn't say, all right, forget the whole law thing. What he did was he provided an obedient Israelite to keep it. But it goes beyond that. It goes beyond that to include his whole obedience to his father from eternity past, where he agreed to, in that glorious language of Philippians 2, he didn't count equality with God as, as something to hold on to for his own advantage. But he emptied himself, and he dropped lower and lower in his obedience. He took on the form of a man. No, 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 he took on the form of a slave. And he died, and he didn't just die. We're, we're now in the sewer when we find a crucified man. That you can't get any lower than that. That was his obedience too, and therefore God highly exalted him. He went above and beyond the call of duty, if you will, in the modern language. And so Paul, who famously says that he wants to be found in him, not having his own Torah righteousness. Paul says, under the Torah, I was blameless. Oh, Paul, you're deluded. You just think you were. I don't think he was deluded. I think according to the standards of the Torah, he was, for all intents and purposes, blameless. And if he sinned, well, the Torah had a way to deal with sin, right? He said, yeah, nope, don't want that. Here's what I want. I want the righteousness that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. And that brings me briefly to my final point. Justification is an act of God's free grace wherein he pardons all our sins and accepts us as righteous in his sight only for the righteousness of Christ imputed to us and then received by faith alone. I'm closing with Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. By grace through faith is right there in our text. And the Reformation got not one, but two of its famous slogans. I don't know if it's from that verse, but there they are. Sola gratia, by grace alone, and sola fide. So by grace through faith. The first, the sola gratia, refers to God's side, if you will. His favor to us, despite a mountain of of demerits that we bring to him. His favor to us in the face of our demerits, wherein he gives us the gift of life. And the second, sola fide, is how we receive the gift. How do you receive a gift? Well, if you have a crazy uncle, he brings you a gift, he might say, ah, can you get it? Can you get it? Oh, oh, sorry, pulls it back, right? Ordinarily, when someone gives you a gift, how do you receive it? Thank you. There isn't a Benjamin in my hand, right? Benjamin, it's a unit of currency. Okay, you were looking at me like... I'm hip. <laughs> That's street lingo. Right? 
Just receive, accept, thank you, thank you. That's illustrations not new with me. We've been talking that way since at, le at least the Reformation, where faith is the open hand that receives. It's not a work in itself, right, that deserves God's attention and therefore credit. It's just the open hand that receives. We do not do our best in order to receive it, after which God, like a kind father, makes up the difference between what we achieved and where we fell short. That was a version of Roman Catholicism in the 15th and 16th centuries. If that were the case, even if we could merit this much, do you know what we would be? Boasters. We would preen, we would prance, we would love that. We'd compete with one another. Who got more of God's favor? I got this much, but you only got that much. We'd create hierarchies. We'd start pulling rank. Paul says there's no room for boasting in any of this. But beautifully, to trust God's promise that he justifies the ungodly is to glorify God in perhaps the best way possible. Because in effect, with justification by faith in the courtroom, we say to him, you've done the unthinkable because you have justified the ungodly. And we believe you've done that from all our hearts. That glorifies God. So how are you righteous before God? Only by true faith in Jesus Christ. And how it's broken down into parts and explained in the Westminster Shorter Catechism. Mm -hmm. To which we respond, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we confess that the world as it is receives far more of our attention than it deserves. It promises us so much and yet consistently, repeatedly fails to deliver on its promise. And yet we can, be, can remain so foolish as to come to it once more, looking for it to deliver, and therefore not thinking about ultimate and glorious realities revealed to us in your word, a summoning of a court where books will be opened, where the judge of all the earth will be attended by 10,000 times 10,000 holy ones, and we appear there in our own righteousness. This would be a travesty. And the very thought of it should make us quake. But then we remember the righteousness of Jesus Christ that we will put on like a clean robe. And that becomes our confidence at the judgment. And so it is proper for us to respond with simple thanksgiving and praise. We have no reason to boast. Even our growth in grace since we were justified is indeed a growth in grace. And therefore, we still have no reason to boast. We are your workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works that you've appointed for us to do. But we cannot boast in them. And so instead, we return thanks and praise, acknowledging you as the God who is both merciful and just and wise, revealing your wisdom by bringing together mercy and justice 
at the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. And for Him we give you our thanks and praise. And now we pray, minister to us out of your abundance as we come to the table of thanksgiving, to the Eucharist, where we give thanks by worshiping you according to your word in the receiving of the bread and the wine. Bless us through this means of grace, we pray, for we ask it through Christ. Amen. Well, I gave you a lot of words this morning, words and more words and words on top of those. I didn't have any warm, fuzzy stories about when I was a boy and my dog and I went fishing or lessons I learned from my dad. Just lots of words and some of them big words, some of them words that might not be familiar to all of you. The words represent the truth, but if words, if you will, are not enough, then God speaks to us another way. He speaks to us whenever we come to the Lord's table and He confirms spoken words with the elements that we receive in the Lord's Supper. These are, if you will, words too, but they are words in the form of symbols. They signify and seal to us God's commitment to his justified people. And so when we come to the Lord's table, what do we talk about? We talk about a new covenant in his blood. We talk about the remission of sins. And so here, signifying and sealing God's promises to us, the pledge that he's made to us, as if to shore up our faith, is the Lord's Supper. No ordinary supper. The bread is Jesus' body and the wine is his blood. This impresses on us in an even deeper way that what Christ has done for us when he, when he wound up in the sewer of history as a crucified slave under the Roman Empire was to retrieve us from sin and death and to grant us his righteousness in God's court. So as you participate this morning, receive all the grace that God's words has attached to this supper and be encouraged. If you are not a Christian this morning, then please don't come to the Lord's table. And I'll remind you in light of the sermon that you must appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And as it is, you only have your own righteousness to present. That's a scary, scary place to be in a holy court where the one who judges does not judge with what his eyes can see and with what his ears can hear. He doesn't require evidence. He knows and searches the heart and he knows what you've done and who you are. If you are in that category, then please do not receive the elements this morning. But to all the rest who have true faith in Jesus Christ, who is your righteousness, come and let's enjoy a meal in the presence of our Savior. <laughs> 